Hello. The purpose of this video is to outline some of the more important topics uh, that deal with Uniform Commercial Code Article 3 negotiable instruments. Uh, this is going to be one of the primary topics of testability on the Florida Bar offered in October 2020. There are four main areas or topics for organization of Article 3 issues. And I'd like to define those four, but before I do that, I would also like to talk about the what and the why of this very important area of contract law. This is actually a payment system. This is payment on credit, where someone buys something, that's contract one. Then that same person promises to pay over time. If it's a check, it could be two days later when the check is deposited. If it's a promissory note, it could be one year, could be five years, etc. But it's an obligation to pay in future. And there are special rules dealing with these instruments. Before I go further into that, though, the four main topics. The first one is the creation of a negotiable instrument. And with regard to that, I'd like you to think in a particular way. We will go over the main requirements to create a negotiable instrument found in UCC Article 3-104A. However, do not forget that the magic of Article 3, which is a protection of third party, I like to call them innocent investors, is critical and that does not begin until there is an actual negotiation. The person to whom one of these instruments is given needs to transfer it to some third party. And at that point, the magic of Article 3 begins to work. S the second category, the best status that you could have if you were one of these third party innocent investors, and we'll talk about innocent and what that means, is to be a holder in due course. Holder in due course means you take an instrument, there are no problems with it, you are unaware of any problems with it, and because of that, you are entitled to certain special protections. Remember, there's an underlying contract. Perhaps you bought a refrigerator on credit. Perhaps you bought an automobile on credit. Then there's the second contract, which is the promise to pay over time. There is some debt obligation to be finalized, to be honored, to be executed in the future. And with that second contract, falls in the hands of a third party. That is when the magic starts to happen and you, those third parties would like to be holders in due course. Why? Well, holders in due course who take these instruments in the proper ways have special rights such that the payment obligation has to be honored even if something goes wrong with the underlying contract. Let's say that you buy an automobile and it explodes. You want to stop paying for the automobile until it's fixed or replaced. If a holder in due course is holding proper Article 3 negotiable paper, you have to continue to pay, or he or she would have to continue to pay that holder in due course, because that person is innocent of any breach of contract. And what's left is the, the, the dissatisfied party can sue for breach, but still has to pay that innocent third party. And that is the primary magic of Article 3. Uh, and we'll talk about the distinction between personal defenses and real defenses. Holders in due course have certain rights, but there is a point after which they stop. And they stop at real defenses, which we'll talk about. Uh, the final category, looking globally at this big picture, are the various liabilities. If someone makes a note or drafts or draws a check, he or she becomes obligated not only on the reason for it, you purchase something, there's a contract, then you make a, I'll promise to pay you later, some kind of IOU, even a check, which is a form of IOU because it takes time to take that check to somebody's bank and collect on it. Uh, there is the uh, responsibility on the underlying obligation. We'll learn it's suspended. But there's also the obligation for having signed that second contract, that negotiable instrument. People who sign, when you think about a check, let's think about a check because it's the most common example, on the back. You are an endorser. 
if you endorse on the back of one of these instruments, in most cases, you take on special liability. You are promising that certain things are non-problematic with this negotiable instrument as it continues down a chain from third party to fourth party, the fifth party to the sixth party. There are ways to limit that liability or exclude it, but not done carefully, these endorsers take on obligations. You might have an accommodation party. That is someone who also signs on the back, but doesn't receive any value. You might have a parent co-sign with you on the back of a check or on the back of a promissory note. He or she doesn't get the car, right? He or she doesn't get the refrigerator, but he or she stands to pay, particularly if you cannot. And we will learn that the law prefers accommodation parties, even though they can be sued, straight up. There are ways that court, case, court precedent, case precedent, tries to force endorsers who actually get consideration with regard to whatever's going on with that note are liable. And accommodation parties shouldn't have to pay. They may have to, but hopefully, it's, it's, it, it, really, it's a form of a secondary liability. Be careful how you say that, though. It doesn't mean that you must sue the endorsers first and only then go after the accommodation parties. There's, uh, well, that's probably more complicated than we can go into. Very important. This is a chart showing what has been tested with regard to UCC Article Three negotiable instruments for nearly 30 years. This chart began since 1993, and up to the last bar exam, you will see, for example, negotiability. Those include the general requirements, tested eight times. Negotiation holder in due course, personal defenses, 15 times. What the definition of a negotiable instrument, what it is, what it requires, how it works, tested 18 times. Remember I mentioned how the issuance or negotiation is, well, negotiation is critical. Issuance is creating it. Negotiation is that first holder who has the right to it, the payee turn it over to that third party. That has been tested 18 times. And so you may have two notes. One, the original payee continues to hold, and the second one gets transferred to some third party. The first one doesn't benefit from Article 3, not yet. And I would make one more point. Well, let me make one more point first here. Other... Uh, uh, Topics have been tested a few times. Co-maker liability, five times. Endorsers, right? We talked about accommodation type parties, two times. Endorsers, eight times. So this list, oh, the transfer warranty, seven times. This list can give you a sense of what is most likely to be tested, okay? The point I want to make, you're taking the Florida bar. You're taking the Michigan bar. You're taking the Iowa bar. The UCC is a model. It's not the law you rely on. Every state, with some, an exception perhaps for Louisiana, has adopted the Uniform Commercial Code. So when you write a state bar exam, you cite to the state adoption of the UCC. And in the great majority of cases, the adoption by states is exactly the same as you've learned from the model code. Okay, be careful. When you have a book in front of you and or a client, you must check. But on the bar exam where you don't have the benefit of holding the code book, you might presume that, and you'd be right at least 90% of the time, that what you learned from the model code in a class has been adopted word for word by your state. Okay, But if you can't remember the numbers, you could say the state adoption of UCC Article 3-302, the state adoption of UCC Article 3-305 on holders in due course, as an example. Okay, why? What is this? This is a credit obligation. You buy a car, you buy some furniture, you buy a refrigerator, but you can't pay for it right away. You have to pay in installments or even a, a, a balloon payment in a year or two. So you have the contract to purchase and then you obligate yourself at the same time to pay it sometime in the future. And here's the idea. People who grab that payment, if, if who take that payment, may want to have cash. They may want not to have to wait that one year, that 10 years. But someone else who's an investor 
can wait that long and receive a rate of return because of that. And so what happens is, if this is done properly under Article 3, the person who first took that credit obligation can transfer it to a third party. But third parties wouldn't want these obligations if they were not entitled to certain protections. And that's why holder in due course status is so important. Uh, it almost operates like cash. You've got something where you pay over the next three years. Someone would take that obligation. Well, it might be $1,000 plus 5% interest. And f over the course of three years, they pay off the 1000 per month plus some interest rate. It could be you know, $75 a month plus the 5% interest. Well, that would end up being something like $1,300 as an example. If an investor bought that paper for $800 and waited three years, he or she would be entitled to collect $1,300 in three years, right? And so take out the $800 that he or she paid for it as an investment, that's a $500 bonus. It's the return on investment broken down in three-year periods, okay? So that's the idea of why this makes sense and it's why the whole system works. Uh, they take three, or two, well, three forms. There are promissory notes, a simple IOU. I promise to pay you $5,000 in 10 years. Or it could be installments. I'll pay you $100 a month for five years. There are also drafts. The drafts where you deal with a bank holding your bank account, your checking account, are called checks. So checks are one of the forms of draft and by far the most popular. Businesses can actually create commercial drafts where there is only the buyer and the seller. And those are relatively specific, not particularly testable. And so based on uh, time constraints, I'm going to leave commercial drafts out of this presentation. Again, one of the reasons why we have all these rules based on Article 3 is that you need to protect these investors who are willing to pay to buy and to hold these negotiable instruments. Otherwise, they would not have any value and it would make no sense. We wouldn't have a system in place. How do you create them? Well, you could look at 3-104A. This is implicit, but they have to be in writing, and the code says authenticated, which typically means signed. Okay, you need to have some proof that this obligation is in place, and almost as a statute of frauds issue, they've got to be in writing. Okay? They can be to bearer or to order. Bearer means you simply say, whoever brings this piece of paper in under the appropriately stated conditions, or according to the appropriately stated conditions, will be paid. Could be you, could be your aunt, could be the your grocer you turned it over to, doesn't matter. If it's bearer paper and they follow the rules, like it might be pay after one year, fine. Pay immediately, on demand, it's also possible. Order paper is where you are creating in the first recipient the right to determine who holds that paper. And so it's not bare paper, it's to order of, which means it could be paid in the order of, fill in your name. If that check goes floating out your window, no one technically could touch it. Someone could try to forge it, and that's another problem. But when it says paid in the order of, insert your name, you don't start the Article 3 magic until you sign on the back and either hand it to someone, well, you would have to hand it to someone, but you have to sign as well with order paper, saying it basically means I am now creating someone other than me who can collect on this. I agree someone else can take this and they can use it, they can submit it, they can transfer it to another party if they choose, and a fourth party, and a fifth party. Uh, the time for payment has to be stated. And it could be on demand, which alerts everyone that with regard to this note, the minute it's brought into where the money is, it's got to be paid. There's also something called a site draft, where, and this is almost the commercial drafts, where someone comes in and says uh, 30 days after site, which means that you bring it in anytime you want. And then the person who's supposed to pay or the company that's supposed to pay 
has to have the cash ready in 30 days. It's still on demand, but it's called a site draft. Uh, also, or it could be a specific time. On the third anniversary, yearly anniversary, of this date of signature, it could be. But that has to be stated somewhere, on demand or at a specific time and date. The amount has to be certain. Right? It can't be for something like 1000 or $2,000, I don't know. No, it's got to be certain. $3,000 paid at the end or payable in installment payments. You can throw in an interest rate right? Uh, that's flexible based on the interest rate uh, for banks month to month. That can be looked up in a newspaper or on the internet and so you can determine it. And then with that, you can come up with an absolute sum certain, so there's no question as to what the amount is. It needs to be easy to calculate, and you know, interest rate doesn't really control that. Let the final condition when you are creating one of these instruments, it must be unconditional. It can't say, for example, I will pay this promissory note so long as the card never breaks down. If it breaks down, I'm not paying for the car anymore. That's your problem. That's a condition, a condition that the underlying contract of purchase is not breached. That cannot be a negotiable instrument. Once something basically ties up the works, it is not the kind of commercial paper, negotiable instrument, that we can treat as deserving of Article Three protections. Uh, that's very testable, and one of the big test issues it would probably be exceptions. There are certain small things that might be mentioned in a negotiable instrument that do not destroy negotiability. For example, if there's a prepayment option and the negotiable instrument mentions that in the underlying contract, not a problem. It's too small. And you can find those in, the, well, there are a few that are actually in Section 3-104A3. And there are several others in 3-106A and B. So having a sense that a few things are too small to be conditions that destroy the negotiability, I think it's an important thing to understand. Understand that a few things are too small, have an example or two in your mind, and hopefully you'll know it when you see it if it shows up on a bar exam. Okay? That's creation. But Article 3 magic still does not arise until the person who receives that negotiable instrument transfers it to that outside third party. That's called negotiation. Often it's at a discount, and the magic of Article 3 begins. Next category. Remember earlier I mentioned that the best thing to be with negotiable instruments is a holder in due course. 3-302A sub 1 and A sub 2 cover the elements for someone to qualify as a holder in due course. And we'll talk about the protections that they receive in a minute. First, the piece of paper that they take needs to be facially okay. If there are a lot of scratch outs, if it's written in crayon, different colors, lots and lots of blanks filled in with different colored pen, that is a danger sign. And it requires the person who wants to take that instrument and be treated as a holder in due course to ask around. There's some due diligence to figure out whether or not it's still valid because when you see on the face of the paper some kind of problem, we don't want people to take those without care because then it just starts all the litigation and all the problems. So there's a duty to act reasonably, due diligence. And if you see a lot of problems on the face of a negotiable instrument, don't take it or do some research to make it sure that it's legitimate because if not, you might be found not to be a holder in due course for your failure to act reasonably under those circumstances. The second main set of requirements to be or to qualify as a holder in due course are in 3-302A sub 2. And there is a laundry list of them uh, or a basket. First, you have to pay value. If you get it as a gift, you get it free, you're not a holder in due course. That's not to say you might not be able to collect. There's a way that you could, but you are not a holder in due course permitted on your own behalf to assert the special rights that holders in due course deserve. You have to take it in good faith. If you know something is very wrong with this note, not on its face, that's the previous element, but 
you know someone just went bankrupt. You know someone already defaulted on making some payments for this particular instrument. You should not take it, and you should not expect to be treated as a holder in due course. Okay? Uh, notice Without notice of certain things like being overdue, dishonored, uncured, default. Uh, the good faith and the notice idea are somewhat linked. If you have notice of certain things, you can't take it in good faith. Okay? You don't have notice of an unauthorized signature or alteration of the instrument. What if it's 3000 and someone changes it to 30000 And you know about that. Well, you're not going to be a holder in due course after that. Okay? So there are several other aspects, including if you have notice of bankruptcy, you can't take a note. Well, bankruptcy discharges liability, even on a note. So we'll talk about that hopefully in a minute. There is the 3-203B shelter rule. And what that says is, if you are not a holder in due course, but you're not a bad person, you're taking the instrument in a bad way, you should be able to borrow the status of the person from whom you took the instrument. So, for example, this is the classic example in case books. Your uncle gives you a note, and he's a holder in due course, and he's fine. And he gives it to you as a gift for your wedding. Well, you didn't pay value, so you're not a holder in due course. But the shelter rule allows you to borrow your uncle's holder in due course status. Because you did nothing wrong. And you could just return the instrument to your uncle, who then could pursue it legally as a holder in due course. So it's almost just cutting out the middleman. Okay, so there are ways... And the shelter rule, to be honest, is one of those very interesting rules, one step deeper than what holders in due course mean, that are tricky enough to make for excellent bar exam questions. Why do you want to be a holder in due course? Well, you are free from personal defenses. And this was mentioned earlier. There's a contract of purchase of something. Then there is a contract for the financing of it, paying over time. And they could be in the same document, but it's actually very helpful to think of them as two separate documents. It'll just make sure that you remember to treat this one when asked one way and to treat the other one when asked another way. This is the contract one. That is the negotiable instruments one. And make sure you keep that distinction always at the forefront of your minds. But... If, for example, the refrigerator breaks down, you can sue the seller for breach. But you still have to pay a holder in due course. If the person who sold you the refrigerator was still holding the note, it never left, there was never any negotiation, Article 3 never comes into play. And that means that if the refrigerator breaks, you don't have to pay on the financing contract because the seller is still holding that financing contract. It's when it gets transferred to some quote-unquote innocent third party that Article 3 really arises, and we protect the sanctity of the right to collect and to avoid personal defenses. Otherwise, these would have no value, and people who receive these drafts or promissory notes could never transfer them for value to other parties. It would just be too risky. Okay? Going back to the reason why we even have Article 3. Um, those, by the way, are called personal defenses, as distinguished from real defenses. The real defenses are the kind of defenses that you learned about in, in your contracts class. Uh, fraud in fact. Uh, legal incapacity. Certain defenses to formation of contract are considered to be so important that even holders in due course are subject to these defenses. And it's a adds risk to holders in due course. And yet public policy has decided for the worst of these actions that lead to a possible contract formation defense, we're going to allow that contract defense to be utilized, to be interposed between the person who's supposed to pay and a holder in due course. Okay? Uh, talked about shelter. Liabilities. Well, when you sign a negotiable instrument as the person who creates it, 
you're obviously liable on that instrument. Keep in mind as well, though, you're also liable on the underlying obligation. If you sign a contract to purchase a refrigerator over time, you have to pay for that refrigerator over time. If you create one of these negotiable instruments, your payment obligation under the first contract is suspended, not removed, not destroyed. While the negotiable instrument is out there and being honored, no one can collect on the underlying purchase contract. If, however, the note becomes invalid for some reason, you still are holding the refrigerator, correct? You're still liable then on the, per the original purchase contract. Okay, so there's a suspension when you create one of these Article Three instruments. But it doesn't mean that you're free from. Let's say you lose a promissory note or you lose a check. Does that mean, yay, I bought it and you lost the check. I don't have to pay. Well, no. You still are getting the benefit from and you purchased something. You have to pay for it. Now, there are steps to go through court processes to recreate a lost, a destroyed instrument. But keep in mind. Now, makers, drawers, if you have more than one, you might, maybe three people will sign a check, a business check. Liability is joint and several, which means you can sue all of them. You can sue one of them on the liability. And if that one person does pay, he or she is entitled to ask of other signatories at the same level for contribution. Endorsers. It starts with the original payee, signs on the back, right? Unless it's a bearer instrument, of course. But uh, if it's a to-order instrument, signing on the back. Transferred to the grocery store, signed on the back. Transferred to the presenting bank, signed on the back. Every time someone signs on the back, they are receiving promises from who they took it, but they also are getting promises or they're giving promises to persons who take this instrument later in the chain. Okay, and that's a system, those are, there's a set of transfer and presentment warranties that is just too complicated right now to go into. We wouldn't have the time. Okay, but understand, there's make or draw liability on the instrument and on the underlying obligation. There's endorser liability on the instrument, but not on the underlying obligation. Obliga or accommodation parties, that is a favored Article Three parlance for endorsers. Someone who signs on the back, but as an accommodation party, signing as a surety or guarantor, not as somebody who's receiving a benefit from the transaction. And it's important to remember that because even though accommodation parties are liable for their endorsements, generally, the law tries to make endorsers who receive some kind of consideration to be the ones responsible first and to avoid responsibility of those accommodation parties. It's dangerous to say they are secondarily liable because they can be sued straight up. But to the extent possible, courts through case precedent will try to make sure that endorsers who receive consideration are the ones who have to pay. Uh, there are a barrage of other topics where there's simply not enough time to cover. If you want to endorse, but you do not want to have any liability on that, no, you want to make no promises as transfer or presentment warranties, you can write above your name without recourse. And anyone looking at that instrument later will see that, know that you're not taking responsibility, and can decide based on the risk now whether or not to continue with buying this at a discount. Uh, there are persons entitled to enforce an instrument. They may not have holder status. They may not have holder in due course status, but they still might be able to uh, take it to court and enforce it. I write you a check for the rent. I forget to sign it. I moved away to another country. You got a check, unsigned. I owe you the rent. What do you do? You are not a holder in due course. Article 3 magic hasn't really started yet, has it? There's a revision. You go to court, prove that I owed you that money for rent, and the court will allow you to enforce the instrument. Okay? Uh, there is a significant body of law with regard to alterations and forgeries. And obviously, if you could make the alterer or forger responsible for losses, you do that. But so often they're uncollectible. Where's the best place 
for responsibility to lie. And that would be with the first person who takes it from an alterer or a forger. Because it's at that point where he or she, had he or she been a little bit more careful, could have prevented the problem. Okay? Um, there's a set of issues regarding where someone collecting on a debt discharges certain endorsers but goes after others and there are certain rules with regard to what happens where someone collecting on one of these negotiable instruments decides to let somebody go. Here, just pay 10% and I won't sue you anymore. I'll sue all the other people. There are repercussions with regard to that. Again, no time to go into that right now. There are a fair number of other small rules. Uh, again, we cannot go into them because time doesn't permit in this format. But try to do this. You saw in slide three a list of issues and the frequency with which they have been tested on the Florida Bar. Can you look at each one and put it into one of the four categories that I've listed? The chart three has more categories than four. It's just a different way of organizing it, but the exercise of where it fits. Is it a how do you create one and why? rule. Is it a can I be a holder in due course or not rule? Is it a if I'm a holder in due course or a person who's subject under the shelter rule to holder in due course protections to what am I entitled, what am I free from and what am I subject to? Those personal versus real defenses. And then the host of other issues which deal with the liabilities. Uh, okay, I hope this helps. And good luck on the bar exam.